You stupid bitch. Yeah, you're a stupid bitch. You stupid bitch. Welcome to the season six premiere of Stupid Bitches Say What? Plus. Oh my God. Can you tell we're excited? Woohoo! The Aussie podcast about everything and nothing, but always with wine and your hosts, Sean Hipkins and Sky Lee Collett. Six seasons. Woohoo! Motherfuckers. <laughs> this episode, it's true crime. And as per our current format, our first TC of the season, we always focus on Australia. Listen in as I cover the unsold case, again, of the Wanda Beach murders. Not the same story just another unsolved case <laughs> the brutal 1965 crime that took the lives of two 15 year old girls on the beaches of Cronulla just yeah. south of Sydney in New South Wales while Sky covers the Logan toolbox murders this one's quite recent really it's the mm -hmm. 2016 case where two people were lured to a unit just south of Brisbane that's where we're based folks where they were tortured and assaulted over a drug dispute turned ugly eek it's really awful too. Um, but you just love no closure, don't you, with these episodes? Like you're just like, you. I need a finale. <laughs> <laughs> I do like a finale as well, um, but it is true. Like, But I had a look to see when I'd done another case like this and it was nearly a year ago. Mm, no, because the one that you did was the, um, that still holds oh, the me Canadian. to this day. And I think about her all the time she pops into my head. True. Okay, I'll make a commitment. My next two will have closure. What was her name again? Cindy James was her oh, name. Poor Cindy James. She haunts me to this day and she probably forever oh, will. That was terrible what that happened to her. That was fucking brutal. True Crime Canada people, if you want to catch up on that episode. Mm -hmm. Season five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so, super sad. What are you drinking, Sky, for this <laughs> wonderful premiere? I'm so glad you asked. And as always, I have a little bit of a tale to tell with what I'm drinking. Um, we will go into um, some shenanigans that we experienced on the weekend, but um, for our lovely listeners, we're podcasting on a Thursday, but Sunday was Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all those amazing people out there who do that job. Um, and also my birthday. <laughs> oh. So as a Mother's Day gift and a birthday gift from my beautiful 17-year-old son, he had some assistance in purchasing this ovs. Oh. Um, I'm drinking Mud House from New Zealand. It's a Sav Blanc. It's oh, you love a Savvy B, don't you? I do love a Savvy B. I'm very, very consistent. <laughs> um, and it is one of my most favourite wines. He surprised me with it. Um, and I just love it so much. And it's just a delicious drop that I cannot get enough of. So thank you, my Linky Lou. I love you. That's oh, what I'm drinking. <laughs> nice. And look at you using the new glass with the star. Does it exactly <laughs> stick? <laughs> That's the last one that has the star on. And thank you, Belinda Bosart, for these beautiful glasses once again. Yes. Little and star we got, shaped. I, I think I left our shot glasses there, did okay. I? And we got some magnets coming too. Bless you. Thank you, Belinda Botez. We love for you, that. Bay. Oh, and what, pray tell, are you drinking, Sean Jenner uh, Hipkins? Well, you stupid bitch. I am drinking a red. Oh. It's also a 2022. It's the weather for it, plus. It is. It's getting chilly here in Oz. It's a Merlot and it's called Feed on the Ground. And it's an angel wine. Don't Drunk know if you've it. seen it. Yeah, I quite love the labels what drew me to mm. it. Mm. And the price, it was kind of like on a fancy price, not too mm. fancy. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, if you're looking at home, the Lovely. label will see the feet on the ground and the roots. Did you say it was a Cab Sav? No, a Merlot. A Merlot. Oh, you don't really normally go with the Merlots, I thought. I thought they're a bit rich, full bodied for you. Oh, no, I love a full bodied. It's more of the Pinot Noir, mm. Shiraz that I'm not really into Shiraz. that much. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Mm. Mm -hmm. So cheers to our season six premiere. Cheers. And I've got our other old faithful stupid bitch glass at Belinda Goddard's basically after we started. Cheers. Chin chin. Season six. Hurrah. It's delicious, I have to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how's your week been, please? Um, my week we get been... the big, big moment out of the room first? <laughs> moment out of the room? 
the elephant in the room. <laughs> Let's just cover the big thing first. It's been a crazy week. Um, it has. It's, you know, surprisingly so, as much as I've had a rip-roaring birthday and we will get into it, um, it's probably the first time in my life that I really haven't had a birthday week, like, full of events um, and celebrations because I've just been too fucking tired um, mm-hmm. and I've had too many other things to do. Well, you're 43 years old now, Pat. Fuck you. Look like 25. <laughs> you still got that age in you. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But, yeah, so just for our dear listeners at home, because we um, here at Stupid Bitches Say What, we like to plan for the unexpected. So we pre-record now ever since the curse of season four. So we are, this episode drops on our premiere, which is June the 6th. We're recording it on May 18th. So Eurovision, <laughs> has, <laughs> Eurovision has just happened four days ago, mm-hmm. as has Sky's birthday. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What did we do for said birthday slash Eurovision? Well, we um, really went out with a bang for birthday slash Eurovision. Um, we got up at, I think, about quarter past four, really, if, yes. if I'm being honest, um, to prep some breakfast items and make some coffees for a household. Um, a full household. It was a full house. Um, frantically opening birthday gifts as I was getting ready for the Eurovision to start. <laughs> <laughs> Sharply at 5 a.m. Um, but what a wonderful day it was. Not happy about who took the title at the end. Very, very disappointed with that. Um, be gone, jury. That's what I'm seeing all over Facebook mm. is be gone, jury, and just allow the public votes. And I feel like I do love the two points. Um, I do love the path. I love the go, announcing, but they could yes. do that still with the Australian votes. They could still Maybe. announce how the votes go, like because the tele vote is based on the same thing, where the most mm. votes gets twelve down to one in the top ten. So they could still release them in that format. There's just no jury, mm. no surprise at the end, I guess. But I think I'm on board with the whole get rid of the jury just because I'm a bit bitter about the overall winner. Um, so ultimately. Don't change the format, Eurovision. I love it. It's just my emotions that are clouding my judgment right now because I'm very unhappy about the winner. Are we going to talk about who won yet? Oh, yes, of course. Because Well, we can talk about it. It's all been released on our socials. But um, that's the thing with Eurovision I find too is it's unlike Christmas, which is <laughs> December hits, you build up to Christmas, have a few parties, it's all done in a day. Eurovision is a two, two, three month procedure, mm-hmm, real mm-hmm. process. You start listening to the songs. You don't like them so much, but then you love them. And then you don't like the ones you loved so much as much as you loved them in the beginning. It's a long process. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of fucking prep. We have a podcast special just dedicated for it. So by the time it's over, it's like, right, I'm deleting that fucking playlist off my phone. I need <laughs> a detox stat. So I can get why at the end of it, you're like, Ugh. And no one would agree with that more than my dear husband. Oh, really? <laughs> Vinny's the same. He's like, yeah, no, he's had to delete it now. I'm still waking up with the songs going on in my head. My I'm this morning was thinking about it. Mama, me, 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 Yeah, going through. But yeah, so. But also Sweden boo Sweden. Won. Love Sweden. Love the place. Love everything about it. But also boo Sweden. I don't think she should have won. That's my I don't. Guess. I don't think she should have won either. And I don't want to take it away from her or Sweden either. I'll just hold on one second. Mm-hmm. Hello, Husband pet. Time. Your dinner's there, but you just need to heat it up. You can heat it up while we're talking about this. It's fine. <laughs> Keep that in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, um... I think, and I don't want to take it away from Lorraine or Sweden. You know, I'm sure she did a great job and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And I hate people that then bully it and all the negativity that comes out of she it afterwards. It kind of annoys. Of the day, though. No, I agree. But I think what ended up happening and what sucked for everyone else except for Sweden and Finland is it became this focus just on Sweden and Finland, mm. knowing that the tele the tele votes were going to go to Finland, knowing that the juries were going to go to. Sweden so that's all people really focused Mm -hmm. on and then a lot of the other artists didn't really get their 
come up their dessert, what they yes, deserve. Yes, 100%. It's almost like um, all the polling that they do ruins it in the end. Like if anything, yeah. I would say, cull the polling, mate. Just let people enjoy it. Yeah. Let's not have, oh, these people are tipped to win. This country is tipped to win. Yeah. This is the best Spotify song. Like it's too much. It's yeah. too much propaganda. Exactly. Um, too much let influence. Let's enjoy it. Yes. 100%. And I think another thing they should do is probably not release any of the songs until a month before and then they can release all the songs at once. Don't know about that one. I just feel that way there's not, because I think Queen of the Kings got a lot of a build up to um, Eurovision because she was one of the first release. She was a banging song. Mm -hmm. So she had a lot of loyal supporters, even though in my opinion, her performance wasn't as matching as the Spotify version. Some of the other ones, yeah. And also, this is what I bleated on a lot about, I think, on Sunday, was that um, <laughs> Lorene was um, the the first song that came up on the Eurovision 2023 playlist. So, of course, the Spotify um, number one yes. spot is going to go to her because that's the first song. And, yeah, she can play it on shuffle, but let's be honest, who gets there in time, like, to shuffle it? You, yeah. you normally hear it and then you shuffle it. By then, the listen's already happened, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's come up first. So she got the top Spotify plays, but because not she legitimately, was first on it. I don't yeah. think. See, they do it different on Apple. It was in order of when they released them. Mm. But I 100% agree with what you're saying. So there were some other fun surprises on the night. It was a surprise that Australia won the telly vote for second semi-final two and then got 21 votes overall. And that's, again, because I think everyone was focusing on the Sweden-Finland uh -huh. um, fight. So that was a bit disappointing for them. And um, just to interject here, and I can honestly speak from the heart when I say this, because last year I did not like Australia's entry at all. So I'm not biased because I come from yeah. Australia, but I 100% wholeheartedly feel that their performance fucking rocked. It did, literally. Like, yeah. it was just amazing. Um, yeah. And, yeah, total Eurovision vibe as well. Like, I just think they were a bit robbed. They were totally robbed. Um, some other surprises of the night was how well Belgium did in the end, mm. which I absolutely loved for him. I was delighted and for him. And got the 12 points from the Australian jury, which I loved. Points. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't Finland and it wasn't bloody Sweden. Although mm -hmm. Finland didn't even get really that many tele vote, um, jury votes, which no. I thought was quite disgraceful. It was crazy. Um, it was it was f quite hard to watch as we saw the country slowly dwindle down. Yeah. And every time it was like that, twelve points goes to Sweden. Yeah, and Israel did quite well as yes, well, which I thought did. was she did do a good performance on the night. Um, France was a surprise. Oh. I thought she was going to rank a lot higher than what she did. Um, agree, but, and my husband's going to listen to this and actually hate me for what I'm about to say, but performance wise, not as amazing as the version that was pre recorded The film clip. Yes. I think what um, hindered her was being up on that huge platform. She Without wasn't able to do all the shoulder moves and the hip movements, which added to the actual overall performance. Because she was concentrating on not fucking falling, falling off. Falling off, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Another fun fun thing to see on the night, and I was surprised that they got through to the grand final, was seeing the Albanian Kardashian family yeah, representing. Not a fan. I know, but it was just hilarious how they literally were Kim, Chloe, Courtney, Rob. <laughs> mother, father, and then Rob in the background, <laughs> shoved to the background. Rob just going, yeah, in <laughs> every now and then. <laughs> it was true representation. <laughs> And, yeah, so the party itself, as you said, at your house was great fun. We'd had the night before our dear friend Maria's birthday, who shares pretty much a birthday with Sky two days after. So we went out for a but lovely dinner. Friends. We were well behaved. We went to bed at mm -hmm. 11 o'clock on the dot, as mm -hmm. we'd planned. Mm -hmm. um, Lucky but I just kept... um, our husbands were in charge. Yeah, I know, totally. Completely bossing us around. We would have woken up on the couch to Belinda <laughs> Maria walking in at 4.30. <laughs> no croissants for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, what? Um, but, yeah, I do remember that night too. I kept waking up randomly thinking, oh, my God, they're awake. It's it's time. And then it would be 2 o'clock or 3 mm -hmm. o'clock. Mm -hmm. So it was good. So what else? Do, oh, and the party itself. Yes, we started with about five fifteen. We started drinking the bubbles and with a splash of OJ. In total, we had fifteen bottles. How and many were left at yours? Left? No, I, not, we, not one. We not left one with one. a bottle. Yeah, I know because I remember Vinny saying, "There's one bottle left." 
Um, and I remember him taking that. We had a two a Tempest two in the fridge that was had been opened but uh, yeah. not fully drunk. Yeah. There was about yay much left in it that I polished off on Monday <laughs> night. No, Sunday <laughs> night. That's after I passed out. All right. I got back up, had a cheeky vom. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I got a and video of that. And said, "It's my fucking birthday. I'm having another champers." Good on you. Good on you. And we had, had also one champers went on the beers. <laughs> two cartons of beers as well. Yeah. <laughs> and they were gone skis. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I don't know how many you took home, but we had. We six only had pack a six left. pack. Yeah, because yeah. I remember insisting that Vinny take a six pack at least home with him, and he was like, "Babe, there's not that much left. Like, if we take a six pack, there's nothing left." And I'm like, "I feel like we equally drunk all this alcohol together. <laughs> yeah. so let's." Split it down the middle. <laughs> no, because yeah, I didn't have any beers on the day. Finney was like glad he switched to the beers. I had quite a few beers in the end. How did you? Good. Yeah, I think. I think it's hard to it's hard to say. It's all a blur. <laughs> we did end up on the couch singing Lose Your Way from Dawson's Creek at one stage. We did. Also, my parents rocked up at oh, one God, point. Oh, God, your afterwards. poor parents. I was um, demanding your mother kiss me. And then I was making them, we remember we were making them watch our highlights yeah. on television and they were both sat there going, this is really good guys yeah great excellent <laughs> thanks for sharing this moment with us yeah also we gotta get to the shops <laughs> <laughs> this is what you get you insisted on coming yeah. well, they i told didn't, them that they did invite us around for a dinner so it couldn't have been that bad <laughs> oh they love you boys so much <laughs> they think you're the greatest so what else happened this week for you well something amazing happened today <gasps> Um, you know how my husband likes to have a little cheeky bet? Yes. He'll, he'll bet on everything, right? So he messaged me about two o'clock at work. The one moment I happened to pick up my phone and look at it because I realised I hadn't looked at it all day and was like, oh, my God, I've probably got 50 missed calls from the child and the husband. And I pick it up and there's a message from Tyler saying that he um, had won $2,000 wow. on a random bet that he had put on. And guess what he had put it on? A horse. Spanish football. Soccer. Mm. <laughs> And guess how much he put on to win two thousand dollars? A thousand dollars. Two dollars. How the fuck did he do that? So he loves a good multi, like he loves yeah. a good like surprise multi. So he bet on a whole bunch of different games that had to win in succession or whatever. Or what I don't know. I don't know the like the technicalities of actually what he did. All I know is he put on two dollars on Spanish soccer. Um, and then he did it really early in the morning. And then by two or three o'clock, he was messaging me saying, babe, I've won two grand. <laughs> and I was like, so he had like a $1,998 profit. Wow. Well, he said to me, he said, imagine if I put $10 on. And I was like, let's not, let's just enjoy yeah, yeah, the two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Straighten the savings. <laughs> yeah. Because I'd have been, well, that could be nice money for the cruise. Yes. Yes. Very much so. So I was very, very happy about oh, that. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Um, well done, Tyler. Everyone at work was like, so how much does he bet though normally? I was like, he has a 25 weekly limit. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's set in sports bet. It kicks him out after he spends $25. Oh, that's cool. Um, but then he usually gets my phone that has no limit because I don't bet like he does. And then it's like, babe, I'm just going to put 20 bucks on your sports bet. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yes. It's almost like savings. Even if he's already put that two thousand dollars into sports bet in the last six months, who cares? Oh now yeah, got you were going to do it anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you may as well get something out of it. Congrats. So amazing. That and is how amazing. about you? Anything else to share? Oh, the only thing I want to share is um, a few shows that I've been watching during our break. First one is because, and some of them you're not going to be into, but I know some of our dear listeners do like to look for a recommendation. First one is um, The Last King of the Cross. Have you seen any of that yet? Everybody it's on Paramount. has been talking about it. And I know it's Aussie. I know yep. it's got the hot guy from Home and Away in it. Um, so, yes, I've had multiple recommendations about it. What Very you good. Think? Yeah, it's excellent. And I don't really like those types of movies that are about, street violence or you know like sort of um organized crime and Me blah, blah, blah. Neither. and i don't I think i said movies but tv shows as well like underbelly i didn't really get into Vinny and i have been doing diplomatically show for show and mm -hmm. series for series That's and this was his choice. Married life <laughs> yes <laughs> it's a democracy and um and yeah no i've 
thoroughly enjoyed it. We've still got about two episodes to go in the series, but I highly recommend it for anyone who mm. wants a good Aussie drama. And it's interesting too, because it's set in the 90s in King's Cross down Based in Sydney. Based on true story too, isn't it? True event, yep. And, um, and it's just funny seeing like when they've got the paper notes out doing some of the fucking lines of Charlie and then it changes into the plastic notes and stuff over the time period that they're... But yeah, no, I highly recommend it. The other two you're not going to be too interested in, but there's a new reality, <laughs> reality show. TV just show. Hit, it's just hit um, on Channel 9 at the moment called The Summit. And Ooh. it's it's actually quite good in the sense it's very adventury. With that really hot guy who um, hosts uh, host it. it and he was in some movies. He was in one of the Terminators. And not, yeah, uh, yeah, one of the Terminators. Oh, uh, what's we'll Genesis ones. one, yeah. Um, ja- not Jared. Uh, what's his name? Jai Courtney. Jai Courtney. He's, he's very good looking. He a is cool drink of water, that fella. He is, he is a tall drink of water. He was in Jack Reacher, A Good Diet, Day to Die Hard, I Frankenstein, mm-hmm. The Exception. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, he's um, he's the host. So people just have to, they're a group of 14 or whatever people. The objective is that's my husband just heating up his dinner. He's been working people. Um, they have to make it to the top of the summit. And along the way, they have to vote people out who are dragging him down, blah, blah, blah. They've got a million do, each, don't they? But they lose it over time. Oh, they get, they've got like about 75K each. It's a million right. in total. And when someone leaves, they their money goes with them. Um, but it's very good. They have to do little challenges along the way. It's quite nice and scenic. It's in Queens, no, New Zealand somewhere. And the next one and the final one is, now I spoke about I the traders. you're like New Zealand somewhere. Didn't you live in New Zealand? It's on the South Island somewhere. <laughs> I was not. Um, and I spoke about the Aussie one in a previous podcast, the TV show The Traitors, where there's three people who are assigned as a trader and the rest are faithful, so they've got to guess who the trader is. Like and we mole. know, Like the mole, but we know who the traders are from the get-go. The US and the UK one dropped on Paramount recently and I've binged both of them. And I have to say, if anyone likes reality shows and the traders and has seen the Aussie version, get onto it. The US one is far superior. It's got some um, reality contestants, past reality contestants in this. So you've got Siri and Stephanie from Survivor, um, Kate Chaston from Below Deck. Do you know her? You would love her. You'd love her in Blow Deck um, and people from Big Brother and whatnot. Um, and the UK one is also fabulous, but that's where I'm going to leave it. If you're looking for some trashy reality, get on to Paramount Plus for the traders and also the King of the Cross, last King of the Cross. Thank you for those recommendations. <gasps> Look, I don't, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I have started the journey of Will and Grace because someone said um, that I have to. I'm so excited that you've done it. <laughs> I am. Um, I'm up to season four at the moment, um, and I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Yeah. And last night there was a few episodes I was watching while Vinny was passed out, and I was just laugh out loud in bed next to him. And usually it takes a lot to make me LOL when I'm solo. LOL when I'm S O L O. It um, is hilarious. And look, I have done it before. I've done the journey, not the new um, revised versions. Um, yeah. the, the new what do you call it? Um, the reboot. The reboot. Um, and the reboot's brilliant as well. I so have done funny. it before, um, but yes, it was um, a blast from the past. And, and you're enjoying it. At one point, what are you watching? <laughs> Why does that guy have a wooden laptop? And I was like, <laughs> it's me, Bino. <laughs> yeah, it <does. laughs> All right, should we get into it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're going first. Okay. Take it away. All right. Wonder Beach Murders Plus. Plus. Have you heard of them? I have, but I don't know any of the details, so I'm very excited to hear. So as we um, established in the intro, I'm doing another unsolved one, and it's also from the 60s, and it actually happened only a year before the Beaumont Children case, which I did last year. It was a horrible time, wasn't it? It also happened on a beach, Mm -hmm. but this time the bodies were found. So I'm going to cover the Wonder Beach Murders. And this is a case where two 15-year-old best friends, Marion Schmidt and Christine Sharrick, were found brutally murdered in the Sand Hills near Wanda Beach, just near Coronella, New South Wales, on the 11th of January 1965. The crime remains unsolved today. However, there have been a large number of leads and potential stu- suspects identified, but we'll get to that. So Marion Schmidt was a German immigrant who'd come over to Australia with her family about seven years prior. 
They moved into a house in Western Sydney and she became best friends with her next door neighbor, Christine Sharrock, who lived with her grandparents. They were thick as thieves, please, and did everything together. Like us. Like us. Where they were at that age where they were finding their freedom. They were talking about boys. They were particularly interested in surfies. They would often go to Wanda Beach to hang out. On the morning of 11 January, however, they were getting ready to head back to Wanda Beach. And on this trip, they were taking Marianne's four younger siblings, Peter, who was 10, Trixie, nine, Wolfgang, eight, and Norbert, six. The mother and father had a busy four years that year, <laughs> along with them. Marianne had said to her mother that morning that she was looking forward to heading back to the sand hills on Wanda Beach, as she'd been there on the most recent trip with Christine earlier that year. Her mother asked her not to go there as the kids would have trouble walking through the sand. However, the group head off to the beach, catching two trains to get there, changing at Redfern Station, a journey that would take about two hours in total. That's commitment, man, to get to a fucking beach. Totes. They arrive at the beach around 11 a.m. to find that it's closed due to high winds. So they head off to some rocks at the end of the beach. Eight-year-old Wolfgang still wanted to swim, so Marianne went with him to a shallow part of the surf away from the rocks. After the, they returned to the group, they had a picnic, and at some point during this time, Christine went off by herself. Not sure why. Could have been to the loo, could have been to speak to boys, could have been to meet boys, who knows. After their picnic and after Christine had returned, they started walking up the beach and ex to explore the sand hills near Wanda Surf Life Saving Club. Hiding their bags on the beach to lighten the load, they walk into the dunes. When they get about 400 metres up from the surf club, they stop to take shelter behind a sand hill as the younger children were complaining about the additions and the wind whipping against their legs. It's here that Marianne and Christine leave them, saying they're going to go fetch the bags to go home. Seeing the girls heading off in the wrong direction, the youngsters call after them, saying, you're going the wrong way. But the two friends just laughed and carried on work, walking. So they knew what they were doing. They were ditching the siblings to go they were meet ditching, someone. That's what it sounds like to me. It's the last time the children see Marianne and Christine. That's fucked in itself. Yeah. I know, <laughs> leaving the 10-year-old and all that. Oh, not that, but just imagine those little kids seeing Sitting the, there, watching them go and then being like, what happens after? Because we know it's going to be awkward. Mm. So four hours went by and they didn't return. So by 5 p.m., Peter decided that they should go home alone. They found their bags untouched on the beach and caught the last train back. Shit. At around 8 p.m. that evening, Peter, Trixie, Wolfgang and Norbert came home without Marianne and Christine. The police are notified immediately of the missing girls. The next morning, their bodies were found by a man who was out walking along the beach with his nephews, his two young nephews. He thought he'd stumbled across a mannequin buried in the sand, but soon, soon realised the terrible truth. The bodies were hidden, were found hidden in the sand dunes. They'd both been brutally beaten and stabbed multiple times. It was relevant from the crime scene that the girls had been murdered in separate locations, and it was determined Marion was attacked first, with Christine being killed about 35 metres away, potentially after fleeing and then being caught. She was apparently caught, then bludgeoned and stabbed before dra being dragged back across the dunes to be partially buried next to Marianne. And that was evident through the drag marks in the sand and the blood smears at the scene. Ooh. Marianne had been mutilated by up to 30 stab wounds and her throat cut so savagely she'd nearly been decapitated. Christine's skull was fractured after being bludgeoned by a heavy object and stabbed, and she was stabbed at least six times. So it sounds like there was more of an issue with Marianne. There were semen samples found on and both there was girls. A group. There was at least more than one person, I reckon. Well, it's funny because they don't really elaborate on that. And I thought the same. I thought, like, how do you stab someone? Obviously, maybe he stabbed her a couple of times, then ran and got Christine and then came back and stabbed Marianne for more. But you'd think, like, there could have at least been two people involved. Mm. There were semen samples found on both girls, which FYI, they discovered this evidence was lost in 2014 after the decades, after decades after the murder, which is super infuriating as they would have been able to do some good DNA tests using that. But finding that evidence led to the thoughts that the killers were sexually motivated, the killings were sexually motivated. And while there was some interference found, like their undies were cut and it looked like attempts had been made to rape them, 
both of their hymens were still intact. And I know it's gross, but that doesn't necessarily mean they weren't raped. Because remember the Golden State Killer who terrorized California? He raped and murdered dozens of women over decades again, but he had a micro penis and also left a victim's hymen intact after he'd raped her. But they thought this had occurred, they thought the sexual um, interference had also occurred post mortem, which is disgusting in itself as well. Investigators gathered numerous, numerous pieces of evidence from the crime scene, including footprints, cigarette butts, and a partially buried bloodstained knife, which they couldn't link to the murder. Cigarette butts? There's DNA on that alone. I know. It's the 60s, though, you know. Mm. The crime scene, however, was heavily contaminated in the aftermath of the murders due to a lack of forensic expertise and equipment at the time which we hear so many times in these unsolved cases and it in usually contributes cases yeah too. usually contributes to key pieces of evidence being lost or destroyed which also adds to the difficulty in solving the case so the autopsy of the girls found that Christine had a blood alcohol level of 0.015 so it was nothing major but it was there she'd had something to drink and also and Christine's the one who went walking off and left the group by themselves for that little while. And also some un un undigested cabbage and celery, potentially from a Chico roll. Would you like to explain to our overseas listeners what a Chico roll is, please? Well, it's almost like a spring roll, but much larger <laughs> and full of like <laughs> fried vegetable goop. Well, mm. well it's not fried. The, the spring roll in itself, the Chico roll in itself, I mean, is fried, deep fried. Deep fried. fried. Um, but everything inside is just mushed up vegetable, but it's amazing. Yeah, so good with salt and tomato sauce. It's funny because oh, no when sauce. I was, no sauce. Oh, I can have a little dab of sauce. But when I um when I was thinking, how would you describe it? I was thinking it's kind of like an Aussie spring roll. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's thoughts that maybe she had met with someone when she went off wandering earlier, a friend or a guy she knew or someone that she'd seen and then shared a beer and some foods with him. And then I reckon probably... they went there and then they got made to take the kids. They had plans to meet up with someone, yeah. the two of them, all peoples. And then at the last, all you know, they tried to get rid of the children and be like, no, no, we're just going on our own. And then the parents like, no, fuck that. You taking all these kids with you. Yeah, we want a day off too. And then they had to be dodgy to try to get away. And do what exactly. they originally wanted so to do. So they ditched them off there. They're 15-year-old girls. And even though the mother's... One of the the mother of um, Mary Ann had said in this special I'd watched, um, you know, they were good girls. You know, she wasn't into this. She wasn't into that. It's like yeah, they were 15 year old fucking girls. It was yeah, the 60s. Of course, they're good girls. Yeah. They just want to hang out with some boys. They're, I didn't expect that to happen to them. Exactly. Exactly. And it's funny you say that because my next point is it was also found in one of the girls' diaries after the murder how they had spoken to boys at the Stand Hills during their previous visits. Sandhills. Sandhills. What did I say? Sandhills. <laughs> my house. <laughs> my season six, my house. Thursday night, people. We both have to work tomorrow. <laughs> During the investigation, a number of eyewitnesses reported seeing suspicious individuals in the area around the time of the murders, which always comes out. Remember the Beaumont children, all the shit that they came out with there? Some of which reported seeing a man in his 20s with short blonde hair and a suntan who was behaving strangely and appeared to be watching the girls. Um the last, and there was this was also um, reconfirmed by one of the lifeguards, local lifeguards that was down in, on those beaches at the time, that there used to be this guy who used to creep the girls, some of the women out, who'd go and sit next to him and talk quite sexually to them and blah, 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 but they, and they never saw him after this. And look, you can boohoo social media and technology all you want, but seriously, it's a completely different time now. If some creep was hanging on the beach all the time, There'd be videos everywhere. 100%. You know, there'd be community awareness. And Cell like, phones Watch pinging this off guy. towers. Like, and everyone shit. would be filming everything. So yeah. you can't get away with the shit now. That and you there would get have been the, the CCTV then. footage of them. 100%. Footage. So, um, do, do, do. So the last sighting of the girls, however, or the last confirmed sighting is by a local fireman who was walking with his son in the area. He said he saw the girls apparently hurrying along the sand hills and one of the girls kept often kept looking behind her as if they were being followed, but he didn't see anybody else. And I think what they were doing was probably making sure that the kids weren't following them. Mm. 
making sure that they weren't being tailed by any of the kids. The day the bodies were found, police took the children back to the beach so they could retrace their steps on what happened. It was during this that Wolfgang, who was eight, remember, revealed he had seen Marianne talking to a teenage boy hunting crabs in the rocks. He claimed the boy had a spear for hunting fish and a knife in one of those holder thingies that you, I don't know what the technical word is, sleeve, whatever. Holster. Holster. Yeah, a knife holster. <laughs> A he, sheath. A sheath. That's what it is. <laughs> he also said that he saw the boy talking to the girls as they had walked off into the sand hills and left the kids behind, but just with his knife now. And then again, much later, walking back alone. But there's been doubt about the description of the person because it varied a bit. It was an eight year old at the time trying to help, I guess. Who knows? Despite these, I, Jesus. Despite these eyewitness accounts, no one has ever been identified. Definite. Blah, 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 blah. Despite these eyewitness accounts, no, no one, no. <laughs> no one has ever been definitively linked to the murders. So, of course, there were a range of suspects in the murders who have been investigated over the years. These include not only local residents. Blah, blah. These include not only local residents and known criminals, but also members of the military and even an American serial killer. Wow. who was active in Australia at the time of the murders. So I'm going to go through a couple of them. First one is an Australian-American named Christopher Wilder, a.k.a. the Beauty Queen Killer. This guy is a real piece of work. Two years prior to the Wanda Beach murders, I think he was 15 at the time, and he'd been convicted of a gang rape of a on a Sydney beach of a 13-year-old, which led police to include him as a suspect. Wilder then emigrated to the United States. He was put on probation for that. He then emigrated to the United States in 69. Probation? Probation. Four years later, he um, emigrated to the US where he embarked on a series of serial killings in the early 1980s. While visiting his parents in Australia in 1982, Wilder was charged with sexual offences against two 15-year-old girls whom he had forced to pose nude for photos. His parents wow. posted his bail and he fled back to the US. And in the first half of 1984, he committed eight murders and attempted several more. He actually, he accidentally killed himself during a struggle with police in New Hampshire on the 13th of April, 1984. So they can't get any information from him about this. And they lost the DNA, so they can't test anything from him to actually you piece know, it together. If it was him. Mm. Exactly. But he was called the beauty queen killer because he used to lure um, women into his van or back to his house saying he was a photographer for models and shit like that. There was also notorious, notorious child killer Derek Percy, who had been in prison since 1969 for the murder of a child on a beach in Victoria. Percy was considered too dangerous to be released and is a prime suspect for a number of other murders of children in Melbourne and Sydney. He died in 2013 from cancer. He was considered a leading sus suspect for the Wonder Beach murders by the police. <laughs> suspect. <laughs> suspect. I specifically said, well, Percy can be linked to the location on, on the date of the murders. So he's linked to being in that area on the date of the murders. There are no other links found. And it was hoped he would make confessions on his dead death, but these never. Death his bed. Dead death. <laughs> I think I said dead death. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> His deathbed, <laughs> but these never came. So the motive behind the Wanda Beach murders remains unclear to this day. Some investigators believe that the killer may have been a serial killer who was targeting young women, while others have suggested that the attack may have been a crime of opportunity. Like many unsolved crimes, the Wanda Beach murders have generated a number of conspiracy theories over the years. Police cover-up being one of them. Some people believe that the police covered up the true identity of the killer because he was a prominent figure in society, such as a wealthy businessman or politician. They argue that the police failed to pursue certain leads and deliberately ignored evidence that could have led to the killer's arrest. Apparently, the area of the beach the girls were in are known to be frequented by nudists and can be sex beats for people to, you know, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And that they may, maybe they stumbled upon someone doing some illegal activities or some embarrassing activities. Maybe they sound, saw some big politician or someone engaging in homosexual activities or whatnot. And that's how they ended up having to silence them. But like, who has a knife if you're going there to fuck? You know what I mean? I feel like it was one of the first two. Yeah, I feel like either one of them or that little kid, if that he actually did it. But again... Who knows? I don't think it was a kid. It's a bit hardcore. How are you going to catch like a kid mm. stabbed 30 times? Sounds yeah, like he has some fucking was... creep. Yeah. And that kid would have, well, they, if they didn't know who the kid was, who knows what he grew up to be. But yeah, that's some like serious stuff at that age. Yeah. And 30 stabs. And, it, you know, yeah. Another theory suggests that the murders were carried out by members of an organised crime syndicate and that the police were either complicit in the crime or were prevented from investigating fully due to pressure from powerful criminal elements. And again, it's just like, why would it be an organised crime syndicate killing two kids walking on the beach? That doesn't yeah, make any no sense. Need, especially when there was obvious witnesses, like they might have been far away, but yeah. <clears throat> also on a windy, crazy weather day, Just waiting in the sand dunes to kill some kids, yeah. It is worth noting, however, that there is no concrete evidence to support any of these conspiracy theories and that they are largely the product of speculation and conjecture. Some of the other conspiracy theories I read are a lot more whack than those two. The case was opened again around the early 2000s and it now remains open to this day. It's being actively investigated by the New South Wales Police Force. And by that, it means if I get any leads, I'll look into it. It actually had a significant impact on Australian society and law enforcement. You remember Mm. the Beaumont children did too. Mm -hmm. Like that was Mm -hmm. just like the whole innocence era of Australia had just gone. And it may have contributed to several changes in the law, including the introduction of police forensic units, which was a contamination of crime scene in the aftermath of the murders, highlighted the need for specialised police forensic units to properly handle and process crime scenes. Despite the passing of many years, the families of Marianne and Christine have never given up hope on finding the killer. They continue to press for justice and have worked tirelessly to keep the case in the public eye. The murders have also had a strong impact on Australian pop culture. They have had the subject of been the subject of they have been the subject of numerous books, documentaries, and TV shows, such as Crime Investigation Australia, please, which I watched last night as part of my research. It was actually part of a two-story episode, with the other part of the um, episode being on the Beaumont children. Oh, but no. I turned it off after the Wonder Beach story and watched Will and Grace instead. <laughs> <laughs> Journalist. Oh. Alan Whitaker also wrote a book called The Wonder Beach Murders Inside Story, which my mum gave me a copy of, and it actually inspired me to do cover it in this episode, but I haven't read the book. <laughs> it also inspired fictional accounts in books and movies. The murders were part of the inspiration for the 2005 Australian film Wolf Creek, which actually took its inspiration from a number of Aussie murders mm-hmm, and murderers. Mm-hmm telling the story of a group of backpackers who were hunted Mm -hmm. by a sadistic killer in the outback. It had served as the inspiration for the novel The Night Ferry by Michael Robotham. The work is... Oh, my God, I've read that. Really? Yeah, totes. Years ago, but I don't remember. Uh, Yeah, okay. Well, it's it's a work of fiction, but it's based loosely on the details of the case and has Mm -hmm. become a popular and acclaimed thriller. You'll love this next one. Australian singer-songwriter Paul Kelly wrote a song called Little Decisions. Have you heard that? Because you like Paul Kelly, don't you? I love Paul Kelly. I probably have, but didn't know that there was that kind of reference. Connection. Yeah, so it, it was in 1987, which was inspired by the murders, telling the story of the murders and the impact that they had on the local community. So it'd be a haunting song. So the Wanda Beach murders remains one of the most chilling and mysterious crimes in Australian history. Despite numerous leads and suspects, the killers have never been caught and the case remains open to this day. The brutality of the attack, combined with the fact that the killer has never been identified, has left many wondering what kind of person could have committed such a heinous crime. While the case remains unsolved, it is likely that it will continue to intrigue and haunt the public for many years to come. Yeah, that's the the Wanda Beach murders. 
What do you think? It reminds me of um, the Easy Street Murders as well. Remember the one yes. that I did? Yeah. Where they never, it was completely unsolved. It was so brutal that you cannot believe that someone got away with it. Um, but mm. it's still unsolved. Like yeah. it's fucked. And I know we talk about like all the other countries that we do in true crime and every time we're like, that's messed up. This country's messed up. But all this some messed up shit going on, man. Australia was pretty fucked up with that shit too. And the fact yeah. that they had killers or potential, well, killers in the end, but potential killers of these girls committing sexual abuse and gang rape and being let off so lightly. It's just absolutely terrible. Well, that was hectic and very yeah. sad. I know it's terrible and the poor family. And they had the funerals on the same day um, for oh. both the girls. So oh. Marianne's father, who'd immigrated over with his family the seven years prior to this, he died a few months after they moved into that new house through an illness. And the mother, I think she was in hospital the day the kids went missing and that older brother, Helmet, junior um was at home cleaning the house like if he'd gone with them there's just so many what ifs what ifs what ifs if the beach had been open but they were determined to go to those sand hills and they'd done that done it before yeah she'd shared a beard teenage girls just you know exploring 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 (laughs) life well how many times as kids when we were kids did you say to your parents you're doing one thing Oh, and you're doing it, yeah, totally. My, we used to, me and a friend, my parents used to give us money to go to Rollercade on the third on a Friday night or a Saturday night. We'd get dropped off at Cleveland and we'd walk back home, yeah, and so just stop off like, at the shops on the way and meet up with kids at the red shop and buy a you know box of goon, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Terrible, <laughs> crawl out of bed at the middle of the night and fucking go wandering the streets, and... climb out the windows, yeah, did that a lot. <laughs> Poor little things. Yes, so did I. <laughs> oh, that's tragic. Super tragic. So what have you got for us? The um the Logan toolbox killers. The Logan toolbox murders, please. Um the my murders. story at least has a little bit of closure. Um it's really, really brutally awful. Um okay, so The Logan Toolbox Murders, and you're right in saying that it's much more recent. It was 2016, um, which really isn't that recent because that's like, what, eight years ago now? No, it doesn't seem like eight years ago. No, it doesn't seem like eight years ago. (laughs) It doesn't seem like eight years ago. Um, It's been referred to as one of Queensland's most despicable and horrendous crimes. And I've got to say, maybe um, Australia-wide, unspeakable evil of the worst kind, a double murder where two people were tied up, tortured, and then locked inside a two-metre metal toolbox before being plunged into the murky depths of the Logan Dam. Were they alive when they got thrown in? They were certainly alive. And they would remain there for 18 days until they were found by divers after being reported missing by concerned family. So do you know anything about this? Do you remember this at all? I think think it did. Mate, come back into the the news about two years ago. Uh, 2021 was was the sentencing. Yes, and I think that's where I started hearing about it again. It's really brutal. So, um, again, for for our listeners who aren't local, um, this is pretty much about a 20-minute, 25-minute drive from my house um, where it went down. Um, So pretty scary considering how close it is. Um, So in January 2016, desperate relatives of the victims... Liliana, L- sorry, L- Luliana Trescario. It's it's a hard name to pronounce. She was 28 and Corey Brenton was 31. It is a hard name. When I um was doing the research for the Open, I saw the names. I thought I'm not putting that in there. <laughs> she can get to that. <laughs> so I apologise if I'm not pronouncing it right. Um, but the desperate families of the victims made an appeal to the public pleading for help to find their loved ones who had recently gone missing um it wasn't until february 11th that a crane pulled from scrubby creek in kingston a toolbox weighed down by tires and concrete blocks and was found by divers Jesus. in it were the missing couple's remains you know when you find something like that at the bottom of a lake it's not going to contain tools that's exactly right witness report 
witness reports, and I'll get into this, um, that as the toolbox succumbed to the dam, they were heard, the victims, screaming, Um. pleading for their lives and wrestling to be set free. Corey was married with children of his own, um, but a known drug dealer in Logan and Surrounds. Luliana simply had the misfortune of hanging out with him on the fateful oh, day that they God. were abducted. From comprehensive... The Crown Prosecutor who tried the case said all of the people involved were dealers and users of drugs and the breathtaking evil killers were sparked by a photograph of a smiling person captured on CCTV. The owner of a convenience store in Logan who sold burner phones and purchased drugs from Mr. Corey Breton, one day asked him where he sourced his drugs from and he turned around and told him that it was Islanders. The same man went on to show him a photo of another man asking him, is this him? To which Brenton replied, yes, that's him. The man in the photograph had heard of the interaction and became wary and convinced that he was being set up. God. In the court, it was said that this man smiling in a photograph was clearly the ringleader and it was his paranoia that drove the whole thing. It was he that was giving the orders. He leads the interrogation and torture of both Breton and Triscaru. Daniels, and we'll talk about him later, ordered people to buy cleaning products and kept in direct contact during every step of the murders. The victims were lewd. The victims were... (laughs) (laughs) My house. Welcome to my house, bitch. (laughs) The victims were lured. Lured. (laughs) The victims were lured to a Kingston unit, tortured, assaulted, bound with tape and zip ties before being put in the toolbox. At one point... Miss Triscarou escaped before being recaptured and forced back oh, inside the toolbox. Little bitch. The box was put onto the back of a ute and dumped in the Scrubby Creek Lagoon south of Brisbane. More than two weeks later, police divers found the bodies in the box weighed down by concrete blocks and tires. The bodies were so badly decomposed, doctors could not determine a cause of death, only that the pair could have died from asphyxiation or drowning. Because they would have been fucking just bloated and, yeah. The real horror is that both victims were were confined in the toolbox for at least four hours when they must have known that they were surely going to die. This is also compounded by the fact that they were loaded onto the back of the Hilux in their impending doom. Mm -hmm. The victims were heard yelling and kicking at the toolbox when they left the apartment complex in Kingston. By who? We'll get to that. That annoys me. I know, it gets really bad. Um, Families members told the court of their unending sorrow and grief at both victims' loss. Yeah, because imagine having to live with that, knowing that they went through that. Because you empathy and feeling what they would have been feeling would just be horrendous. Miss Tricuro's mother, Victoria Duga, said her life ended with her daughter's death. And mm. Corey Breton's younger daughter still wakes from nightmares, mm, crying God. out for her father. father. Justice David Bottas described the murders as despicable crimes, senseless and sadistic. Those individuals endured hours of mental and physical suffering, including being locked together in the darkened space of a metal toolbox, he said. Disgracefully, in their final hours, they were deprived of being able to look at each other. Instead, they were placed in a toolbox so that each had to look at each other's feet. As a final indignity, cleaning cloths and rubbish were put into plastic bags and placed in the toolbox with them, as if they were garbage in it, as if they were in a garbage bin. Each victim died in a cold, watery grave. Can I just say though, like them putting the fucking evidence in there with them just shows how fucking stupid these wankers were. Oh, they were just honestly like, ugh, yeah. It's, it's no wonder they got caught immediately. Mm. Um, he went on to say the dreadful acts of psychological torture were an unspeakable evil of the worst kind, showing a complete lack of humanity. 
In further evidence, and wait for this, there's way more. In further evidence, a friend of Mr. Breton's, Leland Harrington, told the court he was at the Kingston unit where it was alleged the pair were tied up and tortured. So his mate was there. Mr. Harrington told the court Mr. Breton and Miss Triscario spent hours on a couch tied up with duct tape and zip ties before being forced into the toolbox. He said at one stage he saw Miss Tris Miss Triscario trying to escape, but she was stopped when Mr. Harrington, the mate, raised the alarm. What a cunt. He goes on to say, as I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw Trent Thrupp standing over her. Blood was coming from her mouth. She's crying and trying to struggle, and they rolled her onto her stomach. D Lock, David Tateo, one of the accused, came over with zip ties and put it around her neck. Oh, my God. Mr. Harrington told the court she continued to struggle as one of the men tried to close the lid of the toolbox. He starts slashing at her arms with a knife. I can hear banging on the toolbox. He continued to tell the court that he heard her kicking and screaming as the toolbox was put on the back of a ute parked in the garage. They almost dropped it. I tried to lift it and it was way too heavy for me, he said. Mr. Harrington told the court two men drove the ute to a dam where it was submerged. He later asked Mr. Thrupp, one of the accused, about the pair's final moments. He told me they were begging for their lives and he shot them both in the head. He didn't. Uh, yeah, because I would have seen that. He said the toolbox kept floating so they used tires and stones. I don't know why they had to do that to her. I broke the one rule my mother gave me, and that was to never hurt a woman. Uh, you did more than break it, bitch. You shattered it. He went on to tell the court he burnt the ute and then went into hiding at his uncle's place. Scumbag. He was tracked down by police while visiting his sister at Browns Plains. I uh, told them it's everything It's weird hearing he said. all these places, isn't I it? I know, right? That we know. I told them everything he said. Mr. Harrington said he was charged with deprivation of liberty and assaulting occasionally bodily harm, but served no time in prison. But that's not, that's bullshit. Nine people were eventually convicted and sentenced for the gruesome murders. Stowe Daniels was sentenced to life in prison. Good. Da Daniels was described by the judge as the ringleader and the orchestrator and conductor of the events that was sparked by his suspicions of Mr. Breton and Miss Triscario. He had lured the pair, he had the <laughs> pair lured to the unit to be interrogated where he assaulted them and then forced them into the toolbox before ordering they be taken to the dam and dumped. So it's all completely premeditated. On one drug dealer saying to someone in a convenience store, hey, yeah, I get my drugs from this guy. And he said, well, is this the guy? And he said, yeah, that's the guy. That was it. Whoa, and then this guy God. turned around and thought, oh, my God, everyone's out to get me. I need to kill these people. Um, as the judge said about Daniels, um, he implicated everyone involved and manipulated them into doing his bidding. So there's nine people accused of this in the end, right? Nine people who were responsible for it. And they all deserve life. At the start of his trial in February 2021, he denied being responsible for their murders and torture, but was ultimately found guilty. Good. Tarungi Thomas Tahita was also sentenced to life in prison. Tahita was responsible for loading the toolbox onto his ute and driving it to Scrubby Creek before dumping it in the water. He described hearing the pair calling out and pleading for their lives after being submerged in the dam. Mm. A court heard Tahita had joined in on the stupid evil plan because his friends had asked him to. He initially denied his involvement before he confessed to police but went on to change his story several times. Tahita eventually led detectives to their bottles, body. <laughs> Tahita eventually led detectives to their bodies. At the start of his trial in 2021, he pleaded not guilty to their murders but was ev eventually convicted by a jury. Good. Trent Thrupp, sentenced to life in prison. Thrupp was characterised by the judge as Daniel's loyal lieutenant who did whatever was asked of him. 
A judge said Thrupp showed no compassion for the pair when he helped force them into the toolbox. Totally. He also Weak. restrained Miss Triscario and put her back in the toolbox when she momentarily escaped. Thrupp then drove with Tahiti to the dam and dumped the toolbox. A court heard that Thrupp put rocks and tires on the top of it when it would not sink. The court also heard the next day Thrupp remarked he broke his one rule that he made to his mum to never hurt a woman. Mm. At the start of his trial, he pleaded guilty to manslaughter after admitted to being at the unit but only helped to clean up blood. The Crown did not accept his plea and a jury found him guilty of the pair's torture and murder. Good. Davy Ta'ayo, sentenced to life in prison. Ta'ayo was described by a judge as an active participant in the pair's killing. He was involved, involved in their assaults and at one point tied a zip tie around Miss Triscaro's neck so tightly it choked, it caused her to choke on her own blood. Mm. A court heard Ta'ayo was not there when the pair were dumped in the dam but knew what would happen to them. Yeah. The court heard the next day Ta'ayo told Thrupp to stop thinking about the murders and pretend like it didn't happen. Ta'ayo pleaded not guilty at the start of his trial but was convicted of both murders and torture. Ducked in. Waylon Walker sentenced to 12 years in jail. Walker was not involved in the intentional killings but the judge said he knew Mr. Breton was being held inside the unit and had been assaulted. They went on to say that at no, at no point Walker showed any decency or took any action to help Mr. Breton. Walker was also outside the unit complex when the toolbox was loaded onto the ute, but claims he did not know the pair were inside. Well, he, he told police the day after They were kicking murders, and screaming for fuck's sake. Exactly. He told police the day after the murders, he drove Daniels and Ta'ayo to a hotel and booked a room for them. On the drive, Walker learned the group had kidnapped some people and got rid of them, allegedly. He said he freaked out after hearing about the deaths on the news and flew home to New Zealand. In 2017, Walker was extradited from Auckland and charged with their murders. Good. He also pleaded not guilty. And a jury agreed but found him guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. Webster Latu, sentenced to 12 years in jail. Latu was at the unit on the day but not involved in torturing the pair. After they were locked inside the toolbox, Latu helped load it onto the ute and then cleaned up their blood. So that's involved in... <laughs> he loaded them up. He's involved in their torture and their fucking death. That's just so bad, isn't it? Yeah. A judge said his offending was still significant as he knew they were being held against their will and had suffered serious injuries. Um, he was originally charged with their murders um, but pleaded guilty to two counts of manslaughter. Tapano Moriri sentenced to 13 years in jail. He was at the unit and among those who sat on the toolbox to stop the pair from escaping. A court heard, the court heard he also helped force Miss Trikuro back into the box into the toolbox when she escaped. Poor bitch. She must have thought, I'm out, I can get away, and then bang. He told others to close the windows to drown out the pair's screams while they were being tortured and later tried to distract neighbours who heard noises coming from inside the toolbox. A judge described his conduct as cold, continuous, and callous and said he showed no respect for either victim as human beings mm. the judge said Mariri did not intend them to die but it was a probable consequence of course it was it's like holding someone down while they're getting fucking beaten to death you sat you're on the holding toolbox. them down while you're drowning them and being like, i don't know the one yeah. was going to kill them he was originally charged with two counts of murder but pleaded guilty to manslaughter and torture and they got he got away with that yeah so he got 13 years. The other two people who knew what was happening and cleaned up and stuff like that got 12 years each. I think they all should have got life, man. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> you just hope they had the worst time in prison, the absolute worst. So <clears throat> Nagatakuna Mariti was sentenced to nine years in jail. She went to the unit to buy drugs and saw the pair sitting on the lounge with their hands and ankles bound. 
She was ordered by Daniels, the original guy, the ringleader, to go and buy alcohol and cleaning products. And when she returned, the pair had been put inside the toolbox and were screaming. After it was loaded onto the ute, Mariti also helped clean up blood. A court heard she believed the group were only going to take the pair for a boot ride and did not think that they would be killed. Of course. And see, like when, and I get that you'd be scared in a situation like that, especially a woman would be scared with all those men around, that when they're sent off to get the cleaning products, that's when you go get the police. A hundred percent. Like, are you serious? She was there to buy drugs, Mm. like in that house. So she wasn't of sound mind. Not that that's any excuse whatsoever, but she yeah. was focused on one thing and one thing only. Yeah. Um, the judge said her dreadful and despicable deeds had allowed events to unfold that would cause their deaths mm-hmm. as Moretti had not contacted police. Exactly. She yeah. pleaded to two counts of manslaughter in 2019 and became a key witness for the prosecution. She got nine years though. Good. So she should. Yeah. And that is it. Yeah, that is fucking terrible. Those poor, poor people. So they were sat in the house fucking bound with all these fucking people around them thinking, why won't one single person help me? Because they were all high on drugs. Off their faces. Yeah. Not that that's any excuse, um, but they were driven by, I guess, a certain thing that meant that they were complicit because they wanted to get high. And this guy was holding all the cards and he was like, do this, you do this, you do that, you do this. And probably getting him high for free because of it. Yeah. Jesus Christ. But what a rotten, horrid way to die. Imagine the fear that they would have been feeling oh, terrified. through that whole ordeal. Absolutely like, terrified. And I reckon they would have been sitting there thinking like after they'd been tortured and stuff, when do we get free? When are we getting were, out? This is enough. Like, you know, we've, we've, or, you know. And the poor chick who was just there, just with her friend, had no involvement in it whatsoever. And was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and was abducted yeah. because she As was As with so many of those, of these yeah. cases we do. Wrong yeah. place, wrong time. Wrong time, time. yeah. Circumstances just led to that. It's scary, isn't it? And Makes you worry. Happened twenty minutes from our house. Yeah. The brutality and the fact that no one put their hand up and said anything. Yeah. And then completely came crumbling down as soon as the police got involved, and they were like, "You guys are in some fucking shit, man!" And they were like, yeah. "I'll tell you what you want to know. I'll yeah, tell exactly. you anything." Too late, Bob Doyle. Can I get and high now, though? It's weird when you think about, as you said, like it was twenty minutes away from where we were. Where you wonder what you were doing on that night while that was happening. 20 minutes away from where we were. That I think is one of the most brutal ways to die ever. Like after the beatings that they copped, after being like restrained and, you know, seeing all these people coming in and out and being single-minded and just, you know, Mm. being there for a single purpose. not giving a shit. You'd feel like you're in the fucking, some alternate universe. Yeah, you'd be like like, blinking like, blink one, help me, blink two, help me more. Like the three duct times, tape, call the, the duct tape and the zip ties are a dead giveaway. I'm not having fun. Yeah. Can you please call help? Can anyone? And then yeah. neighbours heard it as well and that guy went out. That's what like, annoys cool, the it's fuck cool, out of me. It's cool, it's cool, it's cool. Hearing him in a fucking toolbox. Yeah. Like and I get the apartment the... in Kingston, like there would have been other things. Like everyone would have been known something was fucking going yeah. down and been like, oh, we're too scared to go over there, man. Well, you don't have to. Just call the fucking police on them. Exactly, exactly. But I guess, you know, they were probably scared of the ramifications of calling the police and being outed. Like, yeah. And maybe in their defence, not purely knowing what was actually going to happen, like just thinking someone's copping a beating. It probably happened all the time there. Okay, so dear listeners at home, we understand that fear can take control, but if you see someone or hear someone locked in a toolbox getting loaded onto the back of a car, Call the motherfucking police. That's a no, no. Call the police. Do Be anonymous. Please. Yeah. Whisper to them if you need to. <laughs> drive to another <laughs> suburb and call the police from a payphone. Like, yeah. you know, drive to the Gold Coast <laughs> if you want to. Just fucking call them. Jesus Christ. Because then now they have to live with that on their conscience mm. the whole time. Their fear caused them to now, in their way, 
not be responsible for the murders, but you're involved at some level. You know what I mean? Oh, without a doubt. Like, and you know, it's very, um, I did a lot of research on this, but mostly all I came up was the court cases because that's a more recent thing. Mm. Um, and as per usual in Australia, they don't give out a lot of the details because they want to keep it under wraps and it all comes out in court. And that's why I was quoting a lot of the court transcript throughout that because yeah, um, that was the real the- most vivid recollection of what had, had occurred. Um, so there's not a lot of history about their backgrounds or what happened and how it got to that point, um, except for the fact that, you know, some guy was like, hey, this is... And obviously this guy, the ringleader had all these little snitches around who were, you know, working for him, who had observed one interaction at yeah. a petrol station, like, you know. And then it all that all fell out yeah. of control. Like, hey, so, you know, some guy showed a photo of you and some guy was like, yeah, I know him. Yeah. And then that, that's how it all came the out. The grass and motherfucker, I'll get him. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Brutal, but hey. Very brutal. Very brutal. The Australian, as you said, like uh, the American true crime, we always get some juicy cases, but then there's these ones in Australia that pop up where you're just like, holy fuck. That are so messed up. Yeah. And our inability to solve stuff, especially the older stuff. Um, yes. And then I think back to as well, you know, one of the first ones that we did was the, um, and I can't believe I can't remember this, the Bernie, the Bernie killers. Yeah, and the bodies um, in the barrels and shit like that. And they got found out, the Bernie Killers, just because she managed to, someone was shining the light down on her and being like, bitch, you're going to get out. You're going to be okay. And they didn't believe her at first. And then she like just led to them unfolding the whole thing and all those murdered women Yeah, and what they had done for such a long period of time. Um, yeah. I mean, Horrendous. something's got to give at some point, right? Mm, agreed. Agreed. So that's our True Crime Australia season six premiere. It's always a corker, isn't it? The premiere episode. Always a corker with True Crime. Uh, so, all right, cool. All right, so yeah, we'll still, um, we'll do America next, and then India after that. But America, sorry, you got so many stories. You got so many stories. <laughs> it's a big place, and you got some good stories too, as in like interesting, mm. <laughs> intricate. Intricate. Um, but before we get to our next true crime, of course, we have pop culture back in time. And what's the hats? And what are we doing for pop culture again? I forget. It's in the it's in the clothes, so we can cover oh, it there. Right. Yes, yes, yes. I see it now. I can see it. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed our season six premiere episode. Even as dark as it was, we hope we shine a light into your lives by being back. And 50% unsolved, plus. Plus. Tune in next week for our pop culture episode where we discuss the cultural phenomenon that is the 27 Club. Ooh. Ooh. A group of celebrities that died at age 27, often as a result of their high-risk lifestyles. You talking to me? <laughs> Bitch, you ain't 27. <laughs> <laughs> You may think you look it, but you ain't. <laughs> Fuck you. Remember, all five seasons of A Stupid Bitches Say What are now on YouTube. So if you like what you hear or have missed a part, ep- so if you like what you hear or have missed a past episode, why not do yourself a favor and watch the antics unfold on video? Ugh. You get to see my super triple chin all the time that I'm constantly you trying to hide. Don't have a just triple chin. Worse. You get to see our <laughs> drunken behaviors. <laughs> Share, like, and subscribe to your heart's content. Good night, stupid bitches. And I forgot to put this in there. And remember. If you're not whining, you're not winning. <laughs> or if you're whining, you're winning. <laughs> hi, Linky. Is the child on the podcast. <laughs> Say hi to our YouTube fans. <laughs> that stupid bitch. Mm-hmm. He's a stupid bitch. What a stupid bitch. That stupid. Big.